because you didn't help me. Just keep the humble. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Let's get ready for our service today. Let's start with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for another week of life. Um, thank you for letting us gather together in your house. And as we worship you together and we learn from your word, uh, please help us to focus our minds and hearts on you. And thank you, Lord, for giving us life, for leading us until now. Thank you that you are always with us. And uh, we offer this, this service to you, and we ask that you be pleased with it and that we would glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> and I've sort of lost my voice, so I apologize if my singing sounds weird, but I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> so our first song is We Gather Together, a short hymn here. You can believe it. We're already in November, right? And November goes fast with Thanksgiving and then Christmas and then it's another year. So God has brought us so far. Um, it's almost another year of life. And, you know, with so much going on in the world, life is something that's 
that's really special. You know, we shouldn't take it for granted that God let us be alive till now. So this next uh, song is an old hymn. I'm sure you all know it, Greatest Thy Faithfulness. And we can thank God for um, guiding us and being with us till now. Greatest thy faithfulness, O God, my Father, there is no shadow of changing with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions, they fail not. Thus thou hast been, thou fool. Savior, I know for sure. All of 
prepare for our communion. Well, thank you, Eric. I know running on half a voice is always hard, so <laughs> and especially if you're a singer, it makes it hard. But well, welcome today. Um, as most of you know, it's you know Veterans Day weekend and that, and so. I know, thank you, Wendy, for uh, passing all the cute little the b pins out and the hats. Asher, you look really good in the hat, so <laughs> not all of us could wear that so well. <laughs> but if you think about it, why do, we, why do we celebrate Veterans Day? What's the point? There's a couple of obvious things that we celebrate for, right? Service. Right. We're remembering the people that have served. And we're also honoring the people that have served, right? And that. And so, and both of those words seem to be losing some of their meaning in our culture today. But I, th I think still um, it's a very powerful um, time of remembrance. And that is that we get to honor the people that have given and served and, 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 and have dedicated their lives to protecting our country. And that. And so I wanted to think about that idea as we think about communion today, um, how we also want to remember our Savior Jesus, who did something similar. Now, he went further and gave his life for us, and that. But his life was characterized by service, right? And that. And there's several passages, but as he's sharing with his disciples he was talking about um, you know they were bickering about who was the greatest they did that a few times and and so Jesus had to help them out a little bit to understand and that and he said you know the Gentiles how they treat people they lord it over them and they rule over them but it's not to be so among you this is Matthew 20 um, but whoever wishes to become great shall become your servant, and whoever wishes to be first shall be, um, shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so that's the picture that Jesus gives us, you know, that here he is setting the example, not specifically there for his disciples, but ultimately he's setting that example for us too, right? In that he said, this is what living the Christian life looks like, is that we become servant leaders. We don't strive to be the, the one on charge on top, we strive to serve and to love in that. How different that is compared to the culture we live in, right? And that's kind of what Jesus' point was to them. They had the same issue there. They're used to the people that are in charge that just you know, are dictators. And Jesus said, it is not so among us. And that, so one thing we need to do is we need to remember the fact that Jesus served us. Communion is a remembrance that Jesus served us and gave his life for us. And we also need to honor him in that. Part of communion is bringing honor to Jesus for what he has done for us. He makes our relationship with God possible in that. But I think the other piece that um, you know, we have to think about is that what does it look like for us to be servants in that? And this is a verse out of Galatians um, chapter 5. And, and he's talking about walking in the spirit here. And he, and he says, for you were called to freedom, but brethren, only don't turn your freedom into an opportunity but through, um, through the flesh, but through love serve one another. And so that's really Jesus' calling for us. And so as we take time in communion to remember what he did and remember his example, we also have a calling that we're supposed to serve one another and that how well are we doing that and that so as we take communion think about that what does it look like to serve one another in love how do we do that for each other just like jesus did it for us so let's pray heavenly father thank you that you 
loved us beyond what we can imagine. And you sent your son to live among us, to show us what living for you really looks like. And that he set an example of serving and giving and caring and compassion and love. Those are all examples for us. Thank you, Father, that your son Jesus not only came and he served, but he also gave his life on the cross for us, that we might have a relationship with you. So, Father, this morning, help us to remember that great sacrifice and, and the example he set, but also help us to follow in Jesus' footsteps and as he asked um, to serve one another in love as well. So guide us in that. Some days that's hard, but through your power and your strength, we can love and serve one another. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have your communion elements, if anybody needs them, um, Robert's got the tray right behind us there, so. So on the night Jesus was betrayed, um, he blessed the bread and then took the bread and passed it among his disciples and said, take and eat of this. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after he took the cup after giving thanks and he shared it among his disciples, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Partake, drink of this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And he is coming again. Amen? Amen. All right. I'm captured by And I frustrate him. Little grace growers, aren't they? Uh, I was going to talk about disappointment this morning. Disappointment has a, um, there are different kinds of disappointment. I think there are unhealthy disappointments, or maybe not unhealthy, but like when I'm disappointed my team has a bad season. It's real disappointment, but it's not in the big scheme of things very important, right? We're disappointed. Oh, we went, wanted to see a movie and it's not out yet. It's next weekend, not this weekend. It's, it's legitimate disappointment, but it's in the big scheme of things not real important. Then we have the kind of disappointment that comes when we have unmet expectations. My coworkers didn't remember my birthday. Or somebody was insensitive to me. 
and we get we feel disappointed. And again, it's it's authentic, it's genuine disappointment. But sometimes it's self a little selfish, a little self motivated. And then there's the disappointment that comes just from life. You know, this this deeper kind of more heartfelt kind of heavy disappointment that comes to most of us, if not all of us, when things just don't go like we thought they would go, right? Our children get in trouble. Our marriage doesn't make it. Um, a career path that I thought I was really going to go down and be successful in failed. It could, you know, it could be a whole list of things. These, these, these big time, really heavy kinds of disappointments that we experience in life, and they're hard. We hard. I was talking with someone the other day about a tragedy in their life. A really, some things had happened beyond his control. And he was grieving loss. And I, and I was helping him as a chaplain kind of, you know, dig a little deeper and, and kind of find out where that, that grief was coming from. And, and then eventually the light bulb just kind of came on for him. And he said, you know, I just think I'm just, he goes, I just, and I, he had the word and he thought maybe this word doesn't apply. But then he realized it did. He goes, you know, I just, I'm just so disappointed I said, yeah, man, that's grief. That's grief. When you, right or wrong, fair or not, good or bad, you, you had an idea of what was going to happen in your life. Again, maybe it was family, maybe it was career, whatever. And, you, and, you, and, 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 and it wasn't even, not, not necessarily a bad plan. It was just, you know, uh, you thought that something was going to turn out this way and it ended up going that way. And there's just disappointment. There's no better word to describe it. There's disappointment. Well, in our, in our, in our text today, we're going to talk about it fitting. Did you do that on purpose, Barry? Did you talk about servanthood and service on um, while we handle the servant songs in Isaiah? Um, I thought it was a perfect introduction to our sermon today. I think we're going to see in our text that you're not the only one that feels that kind of deep in the gut, deep in the heart, disappointment that things may not be turning out the way you'd hoped. I think we're going to see in our text today, and in not just the text in Isaiah, but in text in the New Testament that we're going to visit, that Jesus felt the same thing. I think one of the most, under, we, I say this a lot, you guys, you're so gracious to me, you forgive me for repeating things over and over and over again. I really, but, I, and I, Barry, I'm going to volunteer you, I think you should do a study on this, the humanity of Jesus. I think it's one of the most, I don't think we give it enough credit. We don't appreciate, we talk a lot about the deity of Jesus, right? The fact that Jesus really was and is God in the flesh. And we should make much of that. That's a big deal. That's an essential of our faith. We believe that the man, Jesus, walking around with his disciples and doing the things he did was God in the flesh. But I, don't, I wonder if we appreciate the humanity of Jesus as well. The fact that he was a real person that experienced emotions had good days and not so great days had days where he probably was you know i'm in a i'm in a good mood today i'm feeling encouraged i'm feeling you know raring to go and then days not so much just like the rest of us i want to be careful don't want to ever suggest that that he was exactly like us 
because Jesus never sinned. He never used those bad days as an excuse to walk in the flesh and sin against God. Never used those tough days or tough circumstances as an excuse to sin. Uh, We must never assume that. But I think it would be wrong to assume that Jesus never got sad, that Jesus never was emotionally hurt. I think you see that um, when Peter denied him. I think it hurt Jesus to the core, the human, right? Jesus knew what was going to happen, right? And yet when his, one of his best friends in the whole world just sold him down the river, it must have really wounded him, must have, that my friend would do that to me when Judas did that to him. But when Jesus experienced real, live emotions, and Jesus knew what it was like to be disappointed. And that's when you start wading in those swampy, muddy waters, and you think, well, yeah, well he, he couldn't be disappointed because he knows the beginning from the end. He's God in the flesh. Well, then you start to, either, either way you go, right, you begin to get unbalanced towards his deity or towards his humanity. And it's, a, it's kind of walking on a tightrope, this, this um, trying to figure out, and it's probably why we should not even try, how how a person, the only person in the history of the world, could both be fully God and fully man. How do you wrap your head around that? One little sidelight, you know when he he tells his disciples, remember when Lazarus dies? He tells his disciples, um, uh, Lazarus has died. He knew that supernaturally. In his deity, he knew that Lazarus, his friend, had died. And then they get to Bethany. You know what the Bible says? You know, you're just reading the story. It's easy to miss. But he asked, hey, so where did you bury him? And I remember the first time it kind of dawned on me, well, wait a second, Jesus. You knew, supernaturally knew that Lazarus had died. And then when you get to Bethany, you need someone to tell you where the tomb is. It's just that there were times, lots of times, When Jesus chose to not take it, I think this is what Paul talks about in Philippians, right? He humbled himself. He did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. What he means is, I saw you repeat that. It means is he did not consider equality with God something to always be taken advantage of. He chose to live as a real life human being. He got hungry. He got thirsty, right? He had to go to the bathroom. He probably caught a cold. He did all these things that real life human beings do because he was a real live human being. It's 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 crazy. And so it yeah, it's just it's mind blowing. Remember, don't I joke about this with other people, other chaplains from different faith traditions. I always say I'm not gonna beat you up too bad about your crazy theological ideas. Because I accept the fact that as a Christian, I've got some pretty crazy theological things that I hold to be true. I worship a guy that was really fully God and a real full human being at the same time. That's kind of out there. But I believe it to be true. I believe it to be true. But I believe, right, right. I believe that Jesus knew what it felt like to be disappointed I love that that we sang greatest thy faithfulness today one of the passages in scripture that has brought me great great peace and joy in times of of sorrow is Lamentations 3 of course you know this passage it's a good one to have highlighted a bookmark stuck in there when you're feeling low and feeling like God has passed you over um Jeremiah, of course, wrote Lamentations, and he says in Lamentations 3.19, Remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and the bitterness. Jeremiah was 
greatly disappointed that his people would not heed his word given to him by God to save them from exile, right? He had to have felt unbelievably disappointed. Surely, he says, my soul remembers. Like, I can't help, I can't ever forget this disappointment, this pain, this hurt, and is bowed down. My soul remembers and my soul is bowed down within me. It brings me low. It crushes me. And then in verse 20, 21, maybe, maybe he lifted his chin up. I don't know. Um, who knows how much time went by between verse 20 and 21. But he says, yet this I call to mind. I've got to remind myself. This I call to mind. Therefore, I have hope. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease. His compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I think this is a good model for us. I always say, you know, look at yourself in the mirror <laughs> if you have to. Put it on the, your rear view mirror. It, we have to, re, Paul says we got to renew the mind because we're weak. We're fleshly. We deal, we have the spirit and yet we choose to be in the flesh and it's easy to become discouraged and disappointed like Jeremiah, yet this I call to mind. I'm not going to let myself forget. You have that little schizophrenic conversation with yourself. Darren, I say this as, as I'm driving a sack. There are people drive past me on I-80 going, that dude. I put earbuds in now so people think, oh, he's just talking to someone on the phone. Really, I'm talking to myself. <laughs> this I call to mind. I've got to remember this, Darren. Remember this. Even though it feels like God has forgotten you, that's the last thing he would ever do. That's the last thing he would ever do. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, Jeremiah says. To the person who seeks him, it is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. Jeremiah understood that in that waiting, in that persevering, there's blessing. There's work that God is doing in us. Let him, he goes on to say, it is good for a man that he should bear the yoke. Let him sit alone and be silent. Let his mouth be in the dust. Let him give his cheek to the smiter. Let him be filled with reproach. Whatever it is that's going on in your life, for the Lord will not reject forever. Jeremiah says, it, it, well, I, it, I think God would say, well, Jeremiah, you know, the Lord will not reject at all. But I know that it feels like I'm rejecting. Jeremiah, I love the Bible writers. They talk like a human would talk, right? Like we would say. I don't believe that God has rejected Jeremiah at all, yet he feels like that. And so he says, the Lord's not going to leave me here forever. This is not the end of my story. For if he causes grief... Then he will have compassion according to his abundant loving kindness. Major disappointment and heartbreak for Jeremiah. Yet he realizes this is not the end of my story. And likewise, Jesus, our Savior, God in the flesh, I believe experienced the same thing. We're going to be in Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49, if you've got your Bibles or you've got your phones. This is the second of what's called the servant songs in the book of Isaiah. There's four of them. The servant songs is what they're called. And they speak of a coming Messiah. We know this person to be Jesus because remember last week I wrote that, I wrote, I read that section in Luke where at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, remember, he stands up in the synagogue, he reads the scroll from Isaiah, right, about a coming servant, coming Messiah, and then the world's best mic drop, what does he do? He rolls it up, sits down, they ask him, what, what, what are you doing? He says, today, this passage, this prophecy has been fulfilled 
in your presence. I am, in other words, I am the guy. I am the one that Isaiah was prophesying about that would come to serve. So we know from Jesus' own words that he was the servant in the servant songs in Isaiah. And today we're going to tackle the second one. What's going on, remember? God's people have been defeated, haven't they? It isn't the first time, won't be the last. They've turned their backs on God, and they've gotten what they've asked for. Now, it's resulted in exile, right? Their temple has been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians. This is the first temple, the one that Solomon built. It's been utterly and completely destroyed. They are taken in bondage. They are taken in chains to Babylon, alienated from their land and their God. If they're not in Jerusalem, if there is no temple where God chose to his presence to be, for the Israelite, that meant that they're not only at home, they're, they are absent from God. So to put it mildly, this is an understatement, their exile, their slavery, their bondage is a crisis of identity and faith. No more homeland, no more God. Are they still God's people? Remember, God had said, look, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to keep you. I've got a plan for you, right? That's why God chose the Israelite people, not because the Israelites were any better than any other people group, but God had to have a people group by which he revealed himself to the world. And that's why he said, I will always protect you. You will always be my people. I will always keep you safe. If you stay loyal to me, I will bless you because I've got plans for the entire world through you. Someone's got to show the world what it means and what it looks like to worship Yahweh. Someone's got to show the world, I've chosen you, Israel, to do that. So stay loyal to me, hold on to me. Don't. It, can you see now why it was such a horrible thing when the Israelites would intermarry and start worshiping other gods and idols? Why God, like, ooh. He, it, when we say God is a jealous God, it's not that God is like, Oh, I can't believe you chose that stone idol over me. That's a petty jealousy that we do, right? That we feel. God's jealousy is like, why would you worship some Baal or some Asherah pole or some other thing that's just a pole or just a rock that can't love you, that can't commune with you, that can't bless you and interact with you like I can? Why would you do that? That's what it means. It's God is jealous. No, I, this is why he would, it would, would anger him so when his people would do that because it defeated, if you will, defeated in quotation marks, the whole purpose of why they were his people. You're supposed to stay loyal to me as I stay loyal to you and the nations, all of the world can see what it means to follow after me, to be my people. You're my people in order to make everyone my people so this is why that was a big deal and so the so they've been carried away into exile they've been carried away into exile and this is where they find themselves can you imagine again the deep heartfelt gut level disappointment disappointment this must be the end of the story this must be the end of the story and it's into this crisis, it's into it, this context that Isaiah speaks a word of hope. God is going to send a servant who will do justice. Much of what we call this section, Isaiah 40 to 55 is often, this will be on the test, is often called second Isaiah. There's three major chunks of Isaiah. 40 to 55 is often called second Isaiah. And it addresses, this is, this is a good, I would say the best part. Isaiah may disagree. This is the part, the second part, 40 to 55, where God, God through the prophet Isaiah, addresses the return of the Israelites to their homeland. This is not going to be the end of the story, by the way, right? 
That's what he's telling them. You feel, I know you feel heartbroken. I know you feel left de- uh, deserted by me. Um, I, I know you feel like this is it, the end, but it's not. I'm going to take you back to where I brought you to, to their homeland, to the promise of a restored temple. And I will be with you once again. So the bondage of exile, right, which is a picture of our bondage to sin, the bondage of exile is replaced by a new freedom. I am going to set you free. Remember, we talk about this a lot. The whole Bible, beginning to end, is a story of how people who become enslaved get set free. Over and over and over again, God is faithful. God never says, this is the last time. Thankfully, right? We would, I would, but he never does. He never does. He's always, remember, God is in the business of redemption. God is in the business of making old things new, of making dead things alive, of changing circumstances. Oh, I get excited when I say that, and then I want to go, so just make sure you change them. Here's the list. Right? Right? This is how I need it to work out. I'm so excited that you don't leave me where I am. Here's how I need it to look. No, Darren. It's better, right? If you would just trust me. If you would just trust me. It's not like, that's the other thing. This this is totally rabbit trail again. It's not like God doesn't want to do what's best for you. Right? It's just that we have this idea of what's best. I have this idea of what's best for me. I, 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 yeah, I I know what's best for me, God. This is what's going to satisfy me. This is what's going to fix my problems. And God says to me, that's not my agenda. My agenda is to do what's best for you so that I can reach others through you. It's much bigger than you could ever imagine. This is what he tells Job when he says, all right, brace yourself like a man while I question you, Job. Where were you when I told the mountains they could go this high and the oceans they could go this far? You know so much. And I don't think he's scolding Job. He's not belittling Job. He's saying, you haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. My plans and my purpose is so much bigger than you. And I'm not telling you that, Job, or insert your name here to make you feel bad. I'm just telling you that and that, 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 that I love you and I care for you and I am going to change things in your life. But it may not always end up looking like you think that it ought to look. But it's what's best. Trust me. Trust me. Easy to preach. So easy to stand up here and do, give it this. Right? Living it's a whole other thing. That's why we're here every week. We, we support each other. We lift each other up. We encourage each other. Hold on, hold on, hold on. And you, Imagine the Israelites feeling this way. So that bondage of exile will be replaced by a new freedom that is more, it's more Israelite in bondage in Babylon. It's going to end up being more than simply bringing you back to Israel. It's going to be more than bringing you back to the way things were like before you got taken into slavery. It's bigger than that. God has something much more in mind. So let's jump into the text Listen to me, O islands, he says in verse 1. And pay attention, you peoples from afar, Isaiah writes. Not just for a certain people group in bondage, but this is, you get a hint here, a very strong hint, that this is for a much bigger idea. Listen to me, O islands, and pay attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me, this servant is speaking here again. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named me. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. 
And in the shadow of his hand, he's concealed me. You get a vision here of something going on behind the scenes that nobody would really know except God. He has concealed me and he has made me a select arrow. You see purpose there, plan there. He has hidden me in his quiver. He has said to me, you are my servant Israel. Now, Isaiah has already identified the servant in one context is the nation of Israel. We know that Jesus represented the nation of Israel. He said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will show my glory. In whom I will show my glory. So again, we see here very clear. Well, you know, you're not supposed to say that, by the way. If any of you ever get to preach or teach, don't say very clearly. Because what might be very clear to me may not be very clear to you. And it's kind of an arrogant you know, I get into these theological discussions with people, and they say, well, the Bible very clearly says. Well, that's funny. You think it's very clear. I don't happen to think that's very clear. So try not to say it. <laughs> I think we see here that God has a plan for this servant person even before he is born. Even before this real-life human being is born, God has planned out a purpose and a goal for this person to accomplish. I think we can see that here. And the servant realizes that God is going to accomplish what he has planned. The servant understands that if God has, has, has set something in motion, he's certainly going to see it completed. That's true of you, by the way, too. In spite of how the servant may see his particular, because Jesus operated in time, didn't he? In spite of how the servant may see particular things going on any given day, God has a plan in place that is going to reach its fruitful conclusion. I think it's healthy for it to stop here and remind us of that as Christians. We, we're, we, we live in this time-constrained world. It's just a reality, right? We live day to day, and our circumstances change from day to day, don't they? And some days it's real easy to be positive about the end result. You get that promotion, your bank account's pretty healthy, you paid all your bills, you got a little extra scratch. That, you know, relationships going well, kids are coming over for Thanksgiving. What, you, man, things are going great. Next day, Right? It often goes like that, doesn't it? And we're, we, we can't help it that we live day to day. We're in this time-constrained universe. You're, hey, someone said once to me, you know, I was lamenting my football team, they were horrible. And they said, hey, your team's never as bad as they look on the real bad day, and they're never as good as they look on the real good day. It's true of our lives. Things are never, you know... Things are going great, praise God. But always be a little aware, you know, things could change. And on those bad days, same thing. This is not going to be the end of my story. The sun will come up tomorrow, like Annie said, right? And so the servant here, we get an indication that he is going to be limited by time. And that he's going to sometimes be up, sometimes be super encouraged, sometimes maybe not. And yet he understands that God has a plan in place for his life. God has a plan in place for his life. And that look what he says in verse 3. You are my servant Israel in whom I will show my glory. In whom I will show my glory. And I was reminded, I'm going to read to you what, what the apostle John says about Jesus in the very first chapter of his book. Chapter um, 1, verse 14. Listen to what John says about Jesus. This is a very familiar passage. The word became flesh. God became a man. 
a real live man, and he dwelt among us. He tabernacled with us. God made his temple his people, right? His, he, he, he came and he dwelt in and amongst other human beings. And we saw his glory, John said. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. A little later in verse 16, his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. John tells us that Jesus revealed the glory of God. When you looked on the face of Jesus, you looked at the face of God in all his glory. And he served us, as, as, as Barry said, while we serve communion. That humbles me. That brings me low. And frankly, in my flesh, I kind of wish it wasn't there. That God could look at me right and say, Darren, when you're disappointed over here and you're ticked off over there and you wonder why so-and-so didn't respect you here, serve them. And I'll say, but it's not fair and it's not just and it's not right. And God would say, exactly. But that's what I did for you, right? You think when Jesus walked the earth, every living thing should have always fallen down face first in the dirt. The living God, the creator of the world, walking, every living thing should have been face first in the dirt. And yet he came to serve. He washed feet. He healed. He, 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 he served other people. He loved on people. It's just amazing to think of this, what he did for his people. And the example he left for us to be despised, to be mistreated, to be disrespected, to be treated so unjustly, and, and yet he just continued to love and just continued to serve. It's just, it's, it's incredible to think that he would do that, and yet he did. The full glory of God was in him, and he served. My mother would... would probably not like that I'm sharing this with you. She would be embarrassed, but she's not watching, hopefully. My mother's on hospice, weeks away from dying. If she makes Christmas, I'd be surprised, hopefully. But at any rate, they give her, she has a caregiver that stays all day and all night. They give her a little four-hour break. So the caregiver goes home at five and comes back at nine to spend the night. Well, my mom is bedbound. She, she had some bathroom issues. My dad calls me. He's panicked. He's 91. My dad can't really flip her over. He says she's, she's had these issues, and I don't know what to do. I said, Dad, I'll be right there. So I drove to Fairfield from Vacaville, and, and uh, I come into the room, and she's in tears because she doesn't want me to clean her, right? And I said, don't. She says, no, I don't want you to do it. I said, Mom, I'm not going to leave you like that. And, and I said, we're going to sing songs, and we're going to talk, and we're going to get this done. And I don't want you to worry about it. This is what we do. But I remember, that's what I remember thinking. I mean, she was my mom, and I'm happy to do it. But I remember thinking as I was doing it, and you know I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back because in, in, any of you would do this for your mother too. But thinking, this is exactly what Jesus would be doing. Right? Jesus wouldn't go like, oh, no, no, no. I mean, who, you want me to do that? That's exactly what Jesus would be doing and what he did for people. He got down in the, in the, the filth and the muck and the mire for his people. That's exactly what Jesus would be doing. And it was a blessing for me to do that for my mother. That's the kind of God we worship. And the kind of God that we worship and say, Lord, we love you. And what does he say? What does he say? He says to Peter, right? Peter, Peter says, I love you. Serve my people. Feed my sheep. Peter, this is how you show me that you love. I know you love me, Peter. I know you do. This is how you show me that. 
go out and love people. I bet Peter was a bit of a, a hard you-know-what, right? I don't think it probably came real natural to Peter to love on people. Peter seems a little rough to me, a little abrasive. Um, tough guy. <laughs> and, 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 and Jesus says, love on people. Love on people. This is how you show me you love me. Love on people. This is what our servant did. In all of God's glory. In verse 4 it says, but I said, and here's where we see the servant, I think, at some point, Isaiah, through, you know, the inspiration of God, Isaiah, I think, gives us a hint here that every day won't be the best of days for the servant. Every day won't be a top of the mountaintop experience for the servant. Because he says, I have toiled in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. It's just, it just meaningless. Yet surely, yet surely the justice due to me is with the Lord and my reward with my God. He says, I'm not going to perhaps see the fruits of my labor here, but again, God is going to complete the plan that he set out and that he put in motion in me and through me before I was even born. Before I was even born. Do you remember um, this passage? As he comes in, he's just entered into Jerusalem on the the donkey, right? We call that the, um, what do we call that? Palm Sunday, we call it the, uh, thank you. The triumphal entry. And then he comes up onto the mountain top or the, the hilltop and he looks down over the, um, the city of Jerusalem, right? And what does he say? And why I didn't hear it is, he says, when he approached Jerusalem, this is in Luke 19, 41. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. He wept over it with a deep sadness and a broken heart. He experienced, God knows what it's like to have a broken heart. God knows when we call out to him, we can't ever say, you don't understand what it's like to hurt this way. You don't understand what it's like to feel this kind of pain and this kind of heartache. And he says to us, yeah, I made sure I could understand that. I've walked in your shoes. Yeah, insert your name here. I can. I know what that feels like, and I'm sorry. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city, and he wept over it. He said, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace... But now they have been hidden from your eyes. And he talks about these horrible things that are going to happen to them in A.D. 70 when the Romans come in and destroy Jerusalem and destroy the temple and leave nothing, just wreak havoc and pain and misery on the inhabitants of the capital city. And it broke God's heart. It broke Jesus' heart. I was with you and I did my best and I tried to get you to see who I was and I served you and I healed you and I, and I, and I loved you the best I could and yet it looks like it didn't amount to much. And he knows soon that they're going to nail him to a cross. In his humanity, he knew that the ending would be tragic and yet he also knew in his humanity that God had a plan in it and you're like well wait doesn't he know and now I'm back to the when he prays in the garden God if there's any other way right that's the human Jesus praying take this cup from me yet not my will yours I would just as soon not do this God and you're like but yeah Jesus you know you have to do that Yes, he does. And yet he's a real live human being that would not like to die. And so how you, I don't know, I'll leave that for Barry and John to harmonize how that works. 
But I just know he felt that anguish. And he felt that pain. And on the cross, and I've said this before, but it's, it's so meaningful to me. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We worship a God who knows what it feels like that, that God may have rejected him. He felt rejected. He felt like God had turned his back on him. Look where I am. Look how I served you and loved you. And I feel like you have rejected me. And that's part of a bigger psalm, by the way. And I believe Jesus, once he continued to think, knew that God had not left him there alone. But I think that's there for us to understand and to know that Jesus knows what it feels like to be rejected. He knows what it feels like to wonder. Did God leave me hanging? Did God leave me here alone? Was this really the way it was supposed to turn out? We worship a God who knows what it feels like to feel that way. The servant will become discouraged. The servant will wonder if his work is all in vain. And now, says the Lord, in verse 5, and now, says the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant. Here you see the servant remembering his purpose, remembering what God has designed him to do and created him to do. Well, we want to be careful with created. Jesus was not created, right? Jesus has always been with the Father, one with the Father and the Spirit. We want to be real careful. We don't say that Jesus was created. Make sure that gets marked down in the notes. Jesus was not created. But the plan was created in a sense. The plan, the purpose of this earthly servant, this earthly Messiah and what he would accomplish. The servant calls to mind. This is why this is happening. To bring Jacob, Israel, back to him. So that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord and my God is my strength. And he says, this is God now speaking to the servant. It is too small a thing that you should be my servant just to raise up the tribes of Israel or the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. You're certainly going to do that. Yes. You're certainly going to do that. Yes. But I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and its Holy One, to the despised one. You see, the, you see God speaking to God here. The one who feels despised, the one who feels brokenhearted, the one who wonders maybe has it worked out the way it's supposed to work out. To the one abhorred by the nation. To the servant of rulers, kings will see and arise. Princes will also bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you, capital Y. Yes, you will accomplish what I have set out for you to accomplish. Yes, you will complete your mission and do what I called you to do from your mother's womb and be worshiped and adored because you share my glory. You are one with me. And it will be, as I said, it will be. John 17, before we close. This is after Jesus weeps over the city. And you feel that, you see the broken heart, you see that misery, you feel the rejection and the despair and the disappointment. He says, um, we call this the high priestly prayer. He prays over his disciples. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Even as you have given me authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give, I may give eternal life. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus, the Messiah, 
whom you have sent. This is Jesus in his flesh acknowledging that God is going to do what he's going to do, all that he set out to do in his life. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So you see the human Jesus saying, yep, you're going, I did what I had to do for you and you were going to accomplish it. You are going to complete it. You are going to see that it gets done and I am going to return to you where I have always been from all eternity past. One day I'm going to ask Jesus, I want you to lay it out. How did that work? How did that work? You in human flesh, fully God, fully man, sometimes operating in, 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 in just in your flesh and, and, and not knowing certain things and in other times embracing your full deity. And it, yeah, it's, it's mind blowing to think. And yet that's the God we worship, fully God. Fully man, Jesus, the Messiah. So God, in, in closing, God has a direction that this story is going, right? Don't, don't fear, Israelites. I'm not going to leave you there. He's got, a, he's got a direction it's going towards the restoration of his people. Yes, the survivors of Israel. The decades of exile produced scattered peoples everywhere. And God is saying, I'm going to bring you back to the land that Israel might be gathered to me in verse 5 of our text today. We can imagine this proclamation falling on the ears of Israel with a sigh of relief, right? Them hearing that and going, okay, good. And if this passage was only about restoring Israel, that would be impressive enough. But it isn't. There's more. God doesn't get stuck there, does he? He says, I have a plan for you, and I'm going to return you to the homeland where you can worship me, but I want to return you to the homeland where you can worship me so that we can spread the gospel, the good news to all the nations. God's people, yes, God's people do not exist for themselves alone, nor is their redemption the end of their story. Do you hear what I'm saying? You do not exist for yourselves as much as i always want to make everything about me god says you are not the whole story man the redemption of the world is the whole story i use darren and insert your name here i use your garbage and the stuff the the garbage that you've created the bad decisions you've made and the and the and the heartache and the pain that's that you endure that was not of your own making. But I use all of it for a bigger purpose. It's not just about making you happy, Darren. It's not just about tying everything up in a neat bow for you. I know that's what you'd like. But it's not all about that. I love you. This is not the end of your story. I've got a plan in place. But you need to understand that it's much, much bigger than you. Get on for the ride, man. Hold on, I'm not going to let you down. You're going to be, you're going to be happy at how it all turns out. Even if there is a season of waiting, like Jeremiah in Lamentations 3. God gathers God's people into God's life for one purpose, the salvation of the world. You are all a part of a much bigger plan. Remember that when you're dealing with your stuff. As heavy and as heartbreaking and as disappointing as I know it can be. Let's go to the, I've got more, but let's go to the final points. God calls unlikely servants who often do not recognize their calling. Some of you are sitting out here. I say this every week, but we're going to keep saying it. You think, nah, I'm just some person living in Pleasant Hill or Concord or wherever. That's, you're talking about 
Jeremiah, you're talking about Isaiah, you're talking about the Messiah. Those are the kinds of people that God raises up to accomplish his plan, right? Not just little old me. No, I got news for you. <laughs> this is the whole purpose of why you were redeemed, of why he, he set you free from the bondage of sin and death and made you his own so that he could be with you for eternity, yes, and that you could enjoy him forever, yes, but so that you could be a part of that plan as he reaches the world. Don't ever think you don't matter. You are an integral part of the plan. You are a gifted, valuable person, a part of the body of Christ, each one of you. And if you're not sure how you fit in, you're not sure how you reach the world or what God intends for you, ask him. Wow, get ready though. God, you, uh, you know, Darren talked on Sunday and I, you know, I confess, I'm kind of wondering what good I am. Would you show me today? Would you show me this week how you intend to use me? Be careful. Because people, you'll, your eyes will be open to the people God is putting in your life on purpose. Again, the person at the 7-Eleven, the, the child in daycare, your grandson that you take care of. It's, it's a part of the plan. Don't think that you're not important. That God is not using you. He is. Secondly, yeah, <laughs> God's people, I just scratch it out. Darren, you do not exist for yourself alone. This is so good to be reminded that the, the world doesn't revolve around me. Nor is your restoration the end of the story. God may, in fact, deliver you from whatever it is you're dealing with right now. And we think, church, we made the church budget. Or, 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 man, I got, you know, I got another two-year contract at the job. Or I met a new person and I've fallen in love. Or I've got, my medical issues have been um, uh, resolved. The, okay, wonderful, and we praise God, we do, we celebrate. By all means, we celebrate. Man, church, real quick. Yeah, we lament with each other and we cry with each other and we rally around each other when we hurt. We got to make sure we celebrate, too. Amen. That's, that's what we, we need to celebrate, too, the blessings and the victories in our life, little ones, big ones, whatever. Amen. Just remember, that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of the story. God has so much more to do in and through our victories and our return from exile. It's not the end of our story. Yeah, and then the third point, yeah, I... The end of our crisis is the beginning of another one. Not, maybe not another, I worded that. Yeah, it's not another crisis necessarily, but another story. And it might be another crisis. Like, how many of you only had one crisis you've dealt with in your life? Right? It's just part of this, this, it's this thing we call living in a fallen world. They come. But God has purpose and intent in it. God has purpose and intent in it. I don't think there was a fourth point, was there? No. Church, I just leave you with this. I've gone on too long today. You, I love you guys so much. You've been such an inspiration to me and an encouragement to me these last however long it's been I've been here, year and a half. I know it must become easy for you to become disappointed and discouraged in whatever it is you're dealing with. Whatever it is you're dealing with. And maybe I was sent here for a season so I could just hammer this over and over with you. God is not done in your life. He's working in your life. He's working in your life. And even if and when he delivers you from this particular thing that you're dealing with right now, remember, that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of the story. Hold on. Hold on. He loves us. He wants what's best for us. Great is his faithfulness. Amen. Let's pray. God, I, I, again, I'm, I'm humbled to be given the opportunity to stand up and preach this message, but I'm also reminded that, that I doubt, too, and wonder, and just the disappointment I feel in my own life and the heartache that I experience, God, Help me not just be a guy who talks a good talk, 
but who really places my faith and trust in you as I'm encouraging everyone here to do as you are through your spirit. God, I pray each and every person here today I know is dealing with something. And it's, and it's a big deal. And there's much disappointment here. And you know what it's like to feel that way. And God, you tell us to come boldly to the throne and ask for what we want. And so I ask for a resolution of conflict in lives here today. I ask for restoration of relationships. I ask for physical healing. I ask for answered prayer, God, so that we can celebrate your good, good gifts. And God, if you ask some of us to wait, which you will most certainly do, then I pray for the faith and the perseverance to continue to hold on in you, trusting that there is a plan in place that you will see to it, you, that will be completed, and that we can trust you and, and love you and worship you in the midst of it. And there could be even joy in the midst of our pain if we keep our eyes focused on you and then again, too, in all of it, God, in good times and in rough times, in the joy and in the heartache, God, encourage us to serve and love each other, to rally around each other, to bless each other until you come again and make all things new and right. We praise you. Holy Spirit work in us so that we can not just listen and go, oh, that was good, but actually put it into practice this week. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's close with one more song. Hear our praises.
in that. A couple quick um, items before we close in prayer. Um, remember our outreach with Operation Christmas Child. Um, so there's still a few of these tickets on the tree out there. These are the gifts that we're going to go buy. Next Sunday, we're going to get together and have a light luncheon, and we're going to put all these gifts into boxes, into the Operation Christmas Child boxes, so that we can send those um, eventually overseas to kids that need, need gifts. In that. So that's next week, but this week we need a few more shoppers, so if you haven't done that yet, grab a few more tickets and then bring those items in next week, or if you have them with you now, you can bring them in now, and we will then next week pack our boxes. So that's coming up very soon. In that. And then we will be meeting again for our final Sunday school class today on our Loving One Another. We're going to talk about love languages. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the message of hope that you brought through Isaiah, through these servant songs, and just the reminder today, Father, that we can rise above our circumstances. Help us to, Father, to see your bigger purpose. Guide us, Lord. You have something. His precious name. Amen. All right. Thank you for coming and God bless you this week.